you. Next slide, Jordan. So today's agenda, we'll like we just did welcome and introductions. We'll do a topic overview. We'll go over the purpose of the, today's event. We're going to spend some time talking about alliance and coalitions and why we put on today's event. And then we're going to have a little bit of a how-to and tips to consider. Um, we were just having a conversation right before you all joined us about how we're building the spaceship that we're on. Some of us have been a part of coalitions for a long time. Some of us are just joining them and some of us are considering um, you know, creating one where we live or where we work. Then we'll go into a little bit about digital opportunity ecosystems and a little bit of a deep dive, but not too much of a deep dive of dis discussion about the different types of potential members and stakeholders that might be a part of this work now or, or others that you should be considering. And then we'll have an interactive breakout and we'll end today as usual with a Q and A. And as usual, um, the reason why we keep things muted and we really want you all to just you know, absorb all this information and really spend more time interacting with each other during the breakouts because all of this information is being recorded and will be shared with you after today's presentation. Next slide. So why are we having these events? So where we are now in today in Texas, a very large state, we have different types of models or convenings or groupings of people that are coming together to work on digital opportunity goals, whether individual individuals, organizations, government entities, or um, how should I say, uh, different sectors. For example, a sector example would be telehealth. So the you know healthcare, public or private healthcare, their telehealth work, it would be a sector or an affinity group. And what is the difference between a local and a statewide network? But we'll get into that a little bit more. A local coalition, I've shared some examples with you today, is one of the oldest ones here in San, San Antonio, which is the Digital Inclusion Alliance of San Antonio, which I believe, as a co-chair, I hope I don't get this wrong, I believe it was started in 2015 or 2016. And it's a culmination of stakeholders that um, have been doing this work, continue to do this work, and it um, has different types of a decision-making model. And then other kinds that have popped up are the affinity groups or sector groups, as I mentioned before, for example, during COVID, um, one of our guest speakers uh, formed the Older Adults and Disabilities Working Group. I'm going to pause right there because I forgot to mention who our special guests are. Um, really quickly, I'm going to pause on this topic overview because y'all can take a minute to look at this. I want to let you all know today, I'm proud to announce that we have two special guests. I'm so embarrassed for not mentioning them. We have Cami Griffins from the Community Technology Network. Cami, I don't know if you want to unmute and say hello. Hi there, uh, Cami Griffiths, Executive Director, Co-Founder of Community Tech Network. I live outside of Austin, Texas, and our work is, our mission is to transform lives through digital equity, and I'll talk more about our role in these different coalitions soon. Yes, post-New Year, back to work uh, issue, sorry. And we, I'm also happy to announce that we have somebody from our my hometown, we just started talking about San Antonio, Rhea Pape, the Executive Director of San Antonio Digital Connects. Yes, thank you, Deanne, happy to be here. Um, I'm, I'm new to my role at SA Digital Connects as of last October, so I'm excited to um, really get the ball rolling again this year after the holiday. Um, our, our goal is that every household in San Antonio and Bear County have access to fast, reliable internet and that they feel safe, secure, and confident online. And so I'm excited to be here with you all and to, to share some um, of our experiences over the past couple of years. Thanks, Deanne. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. Thanks for your understanding. So, yes, yeah, so we've got two great people that represent these different types of coalitions and networks. I would even want to say, like, you could say Rhea and Kami represent, you know, both kinds. Uh, also, just kudos to Kami. She's also on the board of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. So I have different examples here. And then the state networks, Di Texas Digital Equity Network, Connect Nation, and Digital Texas. So all of these are just examples. They're, this is not a um, you know, definite list of like all the coalitions and alliances that you know, um, are available that you can join or be a part of in Texas. It's just to give you us a few examples for today to guide the conversation and ask questions of our special guests. Next slide. So what is the purpose of a um, what is the purpose of a local coalition or a state network? Um, well, the people who are closest to the work are the people who are on the front lines of knowing how a solution could be designed. And so the purpose of these 
groups is not just to bring people together. They're going to meet to meet like nobody wants to attend meetings where they just talk about the issue. But really, it's about how um, how are how's the work going to get done? How's it going to be planned? You know, from device to deployment, if you're working in devices, right from 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 breaking ground to creating a center. So really, the purpose of these coalitions is to do the work, which if you've attended an earlier event, when we define the work, the digital divide is the problem, the digital inclusion work is uh, the work we need to do and digital opportunity, the digital opportunity plan, like that's the goal. Like the, the, the we're trying to go from point A uh, to point Z. Next slide. And, and when we do this work, we have to have some outcomes and there are various models that are out there, which is why we've invited our, our special guests. But the, the reason that the coalition and state networks uniform is because they need to bring people together that, that are, are from so many different sectors. To give you an example, lots of people or lots of organizations that participate in a coalition don't necessarily identify as a digital inclusion advocate, but their organization is an organization that cannot reach its goals unless it works on digital inclusion and digital opportunity goals. So the, the digital divide, the issue, is a barrier of success from them reaching um, their success. Another reason that there's different models is because um, there, uh, there's a huge difference between a local nonprofit and a government or a business or community-based community organization, I'll call that for the sake of today's conversation. And so how they engage and activate the community to do this work can look the same, but can also look different, which is why we'll get into those different models and answer questions about that. And another important thing to point out, whether you're a part of a local coalition or if you're part of a statewide coalition, one of the reasons for success or lack of success is uh, is whether or not there's a cross sharing of information. If there's not a democratic decision making process in place, sometimes fiscal sponsorships are an issue, and sometimes different types of support for either the local network or the state net wide network is needed. And we'll get into some of those opportunities and challenges. Um, but there's some good things that also come out of the work um, when a lot of these best practices or bet, uh, our wraparound support services for coalitions and networks is there. There's direct resources that the public and private partners can work on and use together. There is there is the cross-sharing of information and there is decision models um, in, in place. And there are also strategic plans and there are actual tangible projects that the uh, coalitions and statewide networks work on. Next slide. So there is a process of forming a coalition. It's um, it's not as simple as people just you know uh, scheduling a meeting and and coming together. Like most work and most problems, whether you're working on telehealth, workforce development, or the underhouse community, there there is um, there is research and development involved. You know, and it's, then there's an assessment that takes place, which is why we formed this. One of the reasons why we formed this series is that we are a couple of days away from the public comment period. The the first uh, the version of the TDOP that is available right now shares some of the findings from the assessments that were done throughout the state of Texas. So we encourage you, like we always do, to please visit the the current digital opportunity plan and please take time to go through each section to to look at those findings and see if there's ways that you can offer public comment. Where are, where are the gaps in the assessment? And there's been some feedback about that, or is there more information sharing that needs to happen? Stakeholder engagement. There's been a lot of stakeholder engagement with the Texas Digital Opportunity Plan, but stakeholder engagement, whether you're part of something like the Digital Inclusion Alliance, SA Digital Connects, or Community Technology Network, and so on, really comes down to stakeholder engagement. And it is, if I'm gonna go on a limb here and say that stakeholder engagement is the number one piece of feedback that you will hear about whether or not is there enough stakeholder engagement or community activation going on in this work. So you could be a part of one of the working groups that's been going on with uh, the Texas Broadband Development Office or you could have been attending um, a meeting with the Texas Digital Equity Network. It doesn't matter. There's always this is at the center of the discussion. Is there enough stakeholder engagement? Which is why you always want to be 
um, zooming out to see like who are the stakeholders in the room and whether or not more people need to be involved. And the state of Texas is so large that you could say that like there's always going to be a need for more people to get involved. But since the problem is so big, the more people that are involved, the, the more people who can work on it and help us reach our goals. And strategic plans will not leave the process, not especially not in this version, which is why we're working so hard together collectively as a state on this plan and on our local strategic plans. So whether you're not you're in a rural community or if you're an urban community or your municipality or you're part of the library system, there is a strategic plans that are being um, that are underway or in process to help us work on this, um, work on the digital opportunity plan goals together. And then implementation, which we are probably right now furthest along in implementation than we have been historically on this issue. So if you've been working on this first, like Cami, I'm going to say, Cami, you've been working on this for maybe 10 years or more like me, implementation is where we always want to be. And implementation is what we're, um, what we're hoping to do more of together now with the projects that are underway, with this public comment period, like how um, what feedback about implementation needs to be included in public comment, and how we're going to get to um, the end of this uh, digital equity ro digital opportunity roadmap with implementation, and then always evaluating and adapting. Um, I made a joke earlier about like Bruce Lee's be like water comment is that um, we've seen many uh, coalitions and alliances networks and working groups come and go. And then it, that is also parallel to like what happens with digital inclusion solutions and work is constantly evaluating and adapting. Um, you probably are seeing a lot of evaluation and ad adaptation um, with the uh, affordable connectivity program work if you're doing a direct you know, engagement around that project. And you had to evaluate and adapt because it began as an emergency broadband benefit, right? And then it adapted into ACP. And now there's um, actual work being done to connect people and enroll in that subsidy program. So those are some examples. Next up, next page. So why, again, do you want to um, be learning more about coalitions? Is because an alliance or a coalition equals, hopefully, collective, ac um, collective action and collaboration. Uh, collective decision making and base building are at the center of how this work is being successfully done. There are many examples available across many states, um, but across many um, local communities that are available to read about now from from New York to to California to Georgia and Atlanta, you know, to Georgia, Atlanta and all the southern um, states. There's a lot of information about uh, Collective decision making um, and a decision making model are a little bit similar, but not the same. A decision making model for the alliances and coalitions means that there are a group of people who are going to lead and dedicate time and resources to deciding on how the coalition or how lines or network is, is going to advance and work together. And collective decision making within the, these coalitions and alliances is where the sharing of information and the conversations are being had during the strategic plans so that resources can be maximized or uh, public-private partnerships can be formed or even something as simple as like one organization working with another organization that might be low capacity organizations can, um, can band together to, to go after a project and work on a project together. And I'll give you another example is when a, um, when a research team forms to work with a local community to document stories about devices and skills building and connectivity. Tons of examples out there. And what base building is kind of a term that's jargony as well, Organizations that do this work have a base of individuals. So to give you a simple example, if you're a faith-based organization, such as a church, the members of your church, your congregation, that is your base of individuals. So you always want to be working together and collectively um, action-oriented projects because you want to thread together the most amount of people as possible to be able to do this work because the truth is at the end of the day, uh, reaching reaching individuals who are on the other side of the digital divide that don't have any of the tools or resources such as a device or the skills or their connectivity are the hardest to reach. And most likely these organizations are working with them. And the last one is, um, apart from the tailored solutions that come from those stories, I've learned from doing this work that a community that, uh, the community works together to build something protects 
what it co-designs and builds together. So a community, uh, organizations and individuals and stakeholders that work together very closely on what their digital opportunity plans and goals are going to be are most likely going to be the same people that protect it and make sure that those um, solutions get implemented in their community. Next slide. Uh, what are the what are the other things, Dan, besides um, you know devices and digital skills and ACP programs uh, that the alliances do? There's different types of uh, there's different types of uh, visioning that ends up happening within these. Uh, just because we can't control the tide of telecommunications work and technology moves pretty quickly. Uh, there's different types of advocacy that happen at the local level. There's types of that happen at state level. We saw that with Prop 8. And there's stuff that happens at the federal level that mostly us at the state and local level are not so much involved with, but you could say the ACP program, you know, the bead funding, the Digital Equity Act, those are examples of the kinds of advocacy that happens at the different levels of our decision-making process. And when a coalition or a statewide network exists, they can collectively advocate and so to individually advocate, you know, around those advocacy issues that impact their communities the most. Uh, always what's hardest in any of the work that we do is the, the narrative and the, and the data-driven strategy. We always need information to, uh, to point to the solution and also to make sure that stories from the community or even from our, our decision makers at the local and state level are making its way to those decision makers to make sure that the, the decisions are being, being made on behalf of our communities. Uh, to give you an example, um, you know, older adults, uh, shared their stories about not having a computer or connectivity. So that that sharing of those stories from members of the AARP membership base or OATS from AARP resulted in why funding was, uh, was prioritized for older adults, just as the stories in the media about K through 12 students having those similar issues is the reason why these different priorities were set aside for those funding. Uh, mapping accuracy is always important. This is not a conversation about infrastructure, but also when we're talking about infrastructure, we want to make sure that we have mapping accuracy so that, the again, the best projects can be prioritized, uh, especially those that are underway or being planned. And there's also projects that um, have been worked on for a really long time because the distances um, between communities change. Um, there's other uh, there's other ways that you can build consensus around different issues. I'm not going to go through the FCC challenges, but just know that these were just a few examples. There's not all the examples about the different ways that uh, communities work together on these issues. Next slide. Um, this is where I might uh, poke the uh, pique the interest of the special uh, speakers, but there are a couple of best practices about uh, sustaining a coalition. You got to be patient. Uh, coalitions are, are um, you know, they don't form, you know, just within a couple of days or one conference. They It takes time. It's something technology cannot replace. You can't email 100 people and expect 100 people to show up to a coalition meeting, whether it's virtual or in person. It takes time to start anything, especially because coalitions mostly don't start with funding. Some do, but some don't. Uh, you also have to consider uh, we're, you know, depending on what your lived reality is of your community, because Texas is so different, you know, from across geographies, whether or not you want to include um, ISPs and different stakeholders. There are examples of both uh, there uh, that are available. If you do some research, there are examples of alliances of state networks having ISPs as part of them, um, of their convenings, and also not having them. And there are um, there are different reasons why they are included or not included. And then you want to meet regularly. So we thank you for attending these webinars. You could say we've been meeting regularly every Wednesday, but meeting re regularly keeps up the momentum of this works and make sure that we don't miss any of the due dates that are going to be coming through between now and over the next few months and into the next year around this work. Next slide. There are some challenges that not a lot of us can control. These challenges are similar to what you would might be experiencing if you are part of some, uh, a, for example, if you are working with uh, veterans or people living with disabilities or the underhoused or the food security, uh, food insecurity uh, sectors, 
that one of the challenges is, is a shared language and shared goals. Though that's that's a similar challenge that happens from just you know uh, small organizations and large organizations um, working together. Uh, balancing the interests over time that change is another one, and then recruiting new members is also a challenge, but is highly encouraged. Next slide. We've done a lot of research through, through the, uh, with the help of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, which I'm sourcing them from these last few slides. And they've got guidebooks and roadmaps uh, available. Uh, they even have uh, like template plans and language. And one of the considerations over time is whether or not there should be paid staff. So there are examples of paid staff that lead coalitions and statewide networks. And there are some that are quite successful that have been around for years or they're forming that don't. Um, always ask for help, which is why I invited the, you know, Cami today is that there is a long list of individuals that has grown over time that can help you uh, with this work. I will say that asking for help, I listed National Digital Inclusion Alliance, being that we are doing this work in Texas, I recommend that if you do choose to reach out to another uh, peer or uh, alliance or another state for help or examples, try to find one that looks similar to your community. So I, uh, for me in San Antonio, I would, San Antonio would not be reaching out to a community that didn't look similar to my city or not have similar challenges. Uh, also consider that the demographics, when I say demographics, the size of your community, you wouldn't be using an urban example for a rural solution. Um, and just know that like all work, this work moves at, this, at the speed of, the, of trust. When the trust is not there, as we've seen with the ACP, we, we, it's been very challenging to get people enrolled. And when the trust is there, we've been able to increase the enrollment rates in some of the most vulnerable communities. Next slide. One of the goals outside of the individual solutions that you see or um, that are even presented with with different plans that you might be reading is this term, the digital um, the digital opportunity ecosystem. So what is what is an ecosystem? You will know when you have gone from just being an alliance of stakeholders or um, a list of statewide networks when you can start referring to an ecosystem and an ecosystems is when the different indicators of success have popped up. It means that your community has a combination of programs. It might have drafted and enacted a policy. It means people are working together to address all aspects of digital advice. Something is not being left out. It also means that the internet is available, is at, available at no cost or affordable to most of the, or all of the community or is tracking towards success in that area. And it means most of the community has access to some sort of service for devices or skills. So that's another way of looking to seeing about how uh, you might be not knowing what stakeholder to pull in or if a stakeholder or an organization should be considered is if you look at what your ecosystem goals are, then you can you can start to um, outline and think about other stakeholders that should be considered because you want to like always be um, unpacking and building out your ecosystem. Um, San Antonio, Texas, Austin, Houston, a lot of the a lot of people that are men, um, actually on this call today. I'm, I'm just mentioning a few, and not meaning to leave anybody out. Um, they are like they have established ecosystems and they've been recently acknowledged for their trailblazer work. And just know that that definition changes because our communities change. And so the, you know, the, our communities have to adjust so that we can make sure that we're com completely um, always working on the ecosystem. Next slide. Um, the, the, for some reason, um, our ecosystem list is not popping up. Um, there is a short checklist that we will include here. It's a checklist that unpacks that paragraph that um, I just listed. And we will make sure that that, there we go. Thank you so much. <laughs> Panic when we're on Zoom live. Um, this is a nice checklist to refer to. If you, let's say you're having your first digital inclusion um, alliance meeting or convening, or if you want to start talking to other decision makers, uh, here are just uh, some places to start. You'll know that you know you you're going to have a successful you know convening, or you have people that want to work together. If you can start to align and check off some of these uh, goals, this is not all of them, but this is what's recommended for an ecosystem checklist. 
let's leave that up for a little bit, let you all look at it. And a lot of these things that are listed in this ecosystem checklist are included and outlined in parts of the Texas Digital Opportunity Plan. But if there's items that are not on this checklist, that are would be impactful for your community that should be considered, we please want you to refer to the public comment and try to get something in. Even if it's something small, we're looking for uh, quality con comments over quantity. We're not trying to get the most amount of comments. We're trying to get quality comments. So it could be one or two sentences or a paragraph that really lets us know what should be considered. Next slide. Here's that we're gonna talk about more about like who to, who are the potential members and stakeholders. Uh, when you're thinking of, there's a list, we've got tons of lists and we're gonna share lists with you all in this presentation. We're not gonna go over all of them. We refer to the Digital Equity Act covered populations. Um, that's a great place to start, but it's not exhaustive. Really, you could ask yourself these three questions. Who should be involved with implementation? If you're if you want to uh, work with older adults, or if you want to work with some of those other, uh, you know, uh, covered populations, you're going to have to map out, you know, who needs to be involved, not just the organization, but who's going to like implement that work. Um, it's usually also people closest to the issue. Um, that's not to say that projects um, and programs won't pop up by uh, people that are new to this work or sector that may not have worked on it in the past. So you may want may want to uh, bring those people together so that they, they, they can maximize their time and their resources because one organization might have the research team and the devices, but another organization might actually have the people who need the devices and the digital skills program. So you always wanna be thinking about ways to bring people together to maximize your time and resources to implement. Um, you, I mentioned trust before, if you're an organization that doesn't have the trust of the community, but you have the know-how and the time and the resources and capacity, you want to go out and work with people who can build that trust. Uh, you want to work with um, organizations and individuals that um, are trusted within their communities. Um, I'm not going to name a name, but I work closely with a local leader in South Texas that is an individual that can um, that has access to that phone tree, that old-fashioned church phone tree. And so when there's something important in the community that impacts people living with disabilities or in the um, in the faith-based community, I can rely on that individual's leadership to help me reach those people. Next slide. This is super small on your screens today. I apologize for that. Uh, these are recommended partners and stakeholders described a little bit better than I'm doing today. Uh, the source for this is the NDIA Stakeholder Identification Worksheet. That worksheet has 30 plus more uh, identities and recommendations of potential members and stakeholders on top of this list. So it's this list, and then they got 30 plus other examples. I highly recommend uh, reaching out to get a copy of that worksheet or that list. It's a great tool where you can work within internally within your organization or out in the community publicly to start um, mapping out the different stakeholders and members that might want to be doing this work with you or attend these meetings, or you know, we only have two days left, maybe um, offer a public comment would be my hope. Leave that up for a moment, let y'all check it out because I'm hoping um, who y'all that represent these organizations are on here. All right, next slide. Um, measuring success. Uh, this is uh, my outline for today's conversation about you know how do we measure success? More people know what digital inclusion is. More people know what the digital opportunity plan is. Um, I'm the person slash geek that's at, you know, at the coffee shop asking people like, do you know what the ACP program is, especially if I hear somebody saying that they can't afford internet access. More people are working together instead of working separately. So we want to see more coordination. Um, the establishment of a network, you know, being able to send an email or the host an event with a group of people, whether it's regionally or statewide, more people working together collectively on goals um, means that we will reach those goals quicker. And this one is important to me too. The Texas Digital Opportunity Plan, that plan aside, your local plan aside, federal funding, um, it's a collective effort. And so we need to also be coordinating philanthropic investments 
from other spaces because not one pool of resources is it's going to provide all the solution and all of the investments that we need. So we need to also be working together in coalitions and statewide networks to see what other investments can be made from other areas of the state. Next slide. Um, this is very specific to Texas. In Texas, everything is local. Um, I know that as a Texan, and I still believe in that as a Texan, which is why uh, building a coalition and being part of a, a statewide network is crucial to your success because you want to build power with communities because the communities are the ones that center the, uh, center the work. They have the on the ground stories that we need to know about, and they are at the front lines of everything that's going on at the local, state, and federal level around digital opportunity planning. Here are some examples I know some of y'all are working on. These are not all the examples, but these are some of the examples taking place in our state. And that is because people have been empowered at the local level and the state level, whether it's through Prop 8 or through other projects around these programs. And we can, we've got many people who are on this call that are part of um, different networks and different alliances if you need to know more detail about some of these projects, but we're not gonna mention like specific names of projects here today. Next slide. All right. So we are going to pause the recording for a moment. We're going to give everybody a second to breathe. And then we will be breaking out into our, um, our breakouts for today. Just a reminder, we will be unmuting, stopping the recording, and there will be two working groups. One will be for a region. I represent the Alamo region to give you an example because that's where I live. And then there's statewide. So you can choose to be a part of either. If you don't know what region, please go look. You, you can also be a part of a statewide because you, there are statewide networks and there are like local regional convenings happening, but you get to choose. Um, I would prefer that you all would stay in one the whole time to get the most out of the conversation. But if not, if you need to, if you find out you're in one, you want to be in the other, that's okay too. So we're going to take one half a minute. I'm going to give a half a minute to, uh, to pause the recording. Jordan will go. To Jordan, please go to the last slide. Please use this email address for any further questions and to link to the form. The, the due date for accepting public comment is January 5th. We're gonna turn off the recording now for the Q&A session and we thank all y'all for coming today. Please don't forget to take the poll. <laughs> 